So I have the pleasure of introducing you to our next speaker. Uh, the Legislative Analyst's Office does impartial analysis of state policy, um, budget issues, fiscal issues. They're the fiscal advisor to the legislature. And every November, all 1,000 school districts wait eagerly for the LA report on their fiscal outlook. And so today with us, we have the California State Legislative Analyst, Mac Taylor. So Mac, uh, please come up. And when he's done, we'll actually have a little bit of time for question and answer. So, thanks, Matt. Well, good morning, and thank you, John. Uh, I was just talking to some people. I've been doing this for uh, several years. It's always nice to be invited to an EdSource event. The first ones I did were back in 2008, 9, and 10, when the state was probably at the depths of its very severe budget problems. And, the news basically was bleak and then it got bleaker. So it's nice to be able to be with you today when we have some relatively good news for you. Uh, so that as a, a segue into the presentation, I just wanna talk about where are we with the state's budget in general, both in the budget that we just passed, the 1617 budget, the implications for education, and then look a little bit uh, forward. And while we don't have a crystal ball, uh, we can at least show you what are some possible scenarios that may occur in the future. So let's start with the 1617 budget. Just overall, uh, we have the situation where general fund tax revenues are continuing to grow at a pretty steady pace. Certainly nothing like we experienced in 1415, which was just an incredible uh, year as far as revenues. And because of the way that we've interpreted Proposition 98, it was an incredible year for growth in, in Proposition 98 funding. Uh, so overall spending, grew uh, almost $7 billion, or a 6% increase, which was fairly substantial. Okay, one of the biggest issues that uh, was dealt with in the state budget this year was the level of reserves. And this is a really important issue, as we'll touch on later on, about how you prepare for the next downturn, and it was definitely a priority of the governors. But I want to start with what was the level of reserves in the state budget that we assumed we would end this, at the end of last year on June 30th? And it was $4.6 billion. And again, just to give you some context, that's on a budget of about $120 billion in spending or revenues. So that's what we, in effect, started 1617 with. And then we added $1.3 billion as required by Proposition 2, which the people approved just a few years ago, the rainy day reserve, the budget stabilization count. But we also added even more money to our state reserves. These were, in effect, optional decisions made by the governor and the legislature. The governor proposed an additional $2 billion be placed into our rainy day reserve. And while there was lots of discussion, ultimately that was what was included in the budget. And in addition, just because we didn't spend other res other, uh, all of our revenues, we actually increased our other reserve uh, by $600 million. So when the budget was passed, we had a total of $8.5 billion, or about 7% reserves that are just sitting there that can be used for some future budget problem. And again, as we'll talk about in just a minute, Putting money away in reserves is really important for two reasons. It not only takes money off the table that is not spent on an ongoing basis that builds up your spending base that makes it much more difficult when you have a downturn to make your adjustments, but secondly, the money is there to help cushion the effects when you do have a downturn. So this was a really important part of the overall state budget package. Now, another way to look at sort of the big decisions that were made in the budget this year, I think is illustrated in this chart. And what we did is we said, well, what about all the things we have to spend on? We have to meet the minimum guarantee in Proposition 98. We have to fund various caseload increases and pay for debt service and things like that. But if you think about the so-called discretionary money, what's left over that's available for you to spend the legislature, the governor, on whatever you want, and this sort of shows the decisions that were made about what to do with those discretionary resources. 
And you can see, as we just talked about it, optional reserves was one of the biggest pieces of the money that was available to be committed in some way. Now, the other big piece was temporary spending meaning one time. It's not money, it's not spending that goes into your base that then would have to be adjusted if you had a downturn. This was basically infrastructure spending, state offices, housing, uh, deferred maintenance, and the like. So the second biggest piece by far was on one-time spending. So in thinking about your potential budget problems in the future, these are the most cautious ways that you commit funds. The third way is, of course, you can spend it on ongoing programs. And you can see it was a relatively small piece of the discretionary ref revenues that were available to the legislature. Higher education, some health and human service programs. So this basically followed the proposal of the governor with some adjustments. And again, it was in light of concern about what could happen in the future. OK, let's briefly go, well, what? What did education get this year? What would happen on the Proposition 98 budget? Well, first of all, I think it's always important to know that we update our numbers for Prop 98 as revenues can improve or can go down. So you can see that the June budget, the June of 15-16 budget, the prior year budget, those were the, the numbers that we thought we were gonna have for the minimum guarantee. And you can see in June of 16, they went up for the two prior years. So what happens when revenues increase, we go back and we'll increase the guarantee for those increases. So you can see what we had for those two past years, we had a billion and a half dollars, which are by definition one-time monies because those fiscal years essentially are over, and yet you have the money that must be spent on Proposition 98. They're almost always spent for one-time purposes. And then you could, well, I don't know what happened there, if I did that. There we go, thank you. But then you can see for the budget year, there was an increase of about three and a half billion or 5% over what we had funded in 15-16. That's a very substantial increase. Especially, remember, there is no ADA growth statewide. You may have growth in your district, but statewide it's slightly negative. So all of that increase goes to per pupil increases. It doesn't have to be used for paying for new students in the aggregate. Okay, so that 1.5 billion that I talked about that's for one-time purposes, what do we spend it on? What we've been spending it on for the most part in, prior, in recent years, we pay back our mandate claims that the state owes schools. Now, only about half of it actually went to retire mandate debts, but we give it out to everybody. And the great thing for school district purposes is this money is completely discretionary. They can spend it on whatever they want. They have some deferred maintenance, they have some one-time purchases, they want to buy some buses, whatever they want to do. So it's nice discretionary money for the districts. We also have spent 200 million on a, on a college readiness programs, AP preparation, SAP test preparation, things like that. Now, as far as the increases, so what did we spend that three and a half billion on? Well, as in recent years, the vast majority of the money went for the local control funding formula. That we set this out as our goal of getting to our car targets. And so once again, the vast majority of the money went for that purpose. We also spent some money on career tech and a little bit on preschool, mainly just on some rate adjustments. Now, I think this table is helpful to put what's happened in recent history into some perspective. This is per pupil funding, and this is inflation adjusted. To get a sense for, well, how did we do in recovering from the, the Great Recession? So we start the table in 7-8, which is a year prior to the recession, just to give you some perspective. It's not trying to suggest that 7-8 was some ideal funding formula level, but it's just to give you a perspective of, well, how have we done relative to that year? And I think you can see that while we hit the depths here at about 11-12, We've made some rapid recovery, 12, uh, 12, 13, and then again, as we talked about in 14, 15. We are now about 6% in inflation adjusted per pupil spending above where we were in 7, 8. So we have actually more than regained the losses of the, of the Great Recession. Now, that's total funding again, and I think it's really important 
to remember that that's not going to be the story with all school districts, as people just confirmed. <laughs> If you don't have a lot of supplemental and concentration funding, if you don't have a lot of low-income uh, kids or English uh, learners, you, you're not going to be experiencing this kind of rebound. This is aggregate spending. So it's a, it's a different story when you're looking statewide versus what may be happening in an individual district. So we certainly recognize that. Let's see if I, okay, here we go. Uh, and I'm sorry, it's going to be hard for you to see. Uh, this is, where are we on our local control funding formula? That we set our targets, and that's the dark blue bars, and the little gaps up on top are, how are we moving towards closing the gap and reaching our targets? And I know it's hard to read, but basically the bottom line is down here, that in 1617, we are now at about 96% of our targets. So that we've made some really rapid progress in, in the last three years in moving from when the LCFF was initiated to what our targets are. Well, California Community Colleges, sometimes I, I leave them out, and they have also done very well. They had over $700 million in additional spending over the prior year. How did they, how did the state allocate that money? Well, first of all, we spent a big chunk of money on career tech, on workforce programs, something the state has been paying a lot of attention to in recent years. We also gave them some one-time money for deferred maintenance. We funded enrollment growth, and then we had sort of money left over in the uh, percentage that we allocated to community colleges. So we just gave, it, gave them to it and added apportionment spending, basically more funding per student. So similarly, this chart is very similar to the one we just did for K-12. This is funding in inflation-adjusted dollars per community college student. And once again, you can see that we sort of hit bottom in 11-12, but compared to prior to the recession, we're about 14% above where we were prior to the Great Recession in per-student inflation-adjusted funding. So that's pretty significant, and you can see the sort of progress we've made since we hit bottom, these are like six, seven percent increases per year. That's fairly dramatic. Okay, so now sort of looking well, okay, we, we did pretty well. We've recovered in, the, in recent years. What is the outlook for us? Well, let me give you some sort of just some current information. And this is one we, we like to to use, and I think even the governor has, has taken up the call on this one. And, and that is, how long have recoveries lasted, and, and where are we in comparison? Uh, this is the, the number of months of recovery for prior recessions, and you can see right now at 86 months, it's the fourth longest re uh, recovery in U.S. history. And we're etched up, inching up on number three. And you can see here at the bottom, the average expansion or recovery is only 58 months. Now, that's not try to, su to suggest that, oh, a recession is just around the corner. It's more the perspective of, we have business cycles. Recoveries don't last forever. We're in, at, the, at the tail end of a long recovery. That's why I think the governor and why many members of the legislature are concerned that we're prepared and we're in better shape than we were in 2008 for what hit us then. So it's really just a, a cautionary note. So how have we been doing? Well, job growth in the state has, has been stellar over the past three, four years. This shows uh, average annual growth in jobs for California, the dark bars, versus the United States. And you can see we're almost a point higher in our annual job growth than the country as a whole. Now, granted, we went down further, so we had more to come back. But this still is a good sign that the, the state, even this far into a recovery, is growing uh, more rapidly than the country. And frankly, the job growth now is more statewide. If I had been talking to you even five, six months ago, I would have been emphasizing how much of the state's recovery has been driven by a growth in this area, the Bay Area. The job growth in the metropolitan area, the Bay Area, 
was one of the most rapidly expanding economies in the whole country. And as you can see here, there's still Bay Area counties that are on this list, but at this point, you have recovery throughout the state, even in the Central Valley and in the Inland Empire. All right, well, this is, this is one of my favorite charts. And th this is why we have to be careful, guys. Uh, Prop 98 has hitched its wagon to general fund revenues. And general fund revenues are now funded about two-thirds by the personal income tax. And of the personal income tax, about 50% of it is paid by the top 1% of taxpayers. Those taxpayers have a lot of their income not in wage income, salary income, but in things like capital gains, business income, stock options, things that are very volatile. This is your volatility chart. That if you've heard about volatility in the state revenue structure, this is a good representation of it. Now, capital gains are not the only source of volatility. All taxes have, are volatile to some extent, but capital gains is probably the, the poster child of volatility. And, and this, this shows you. I mean, you can just see the dot-com boom, the dot-com bust, just prior to the recession, the recession, and look, at, look how we're climbing now. Again, not inevitable that we're gonna turn around this year, next year, but the stock market will take a downturn and our revenues are very dependent. You can lose several billion dollars within a very short period of time. And that's general fund revenue that helps drive the Proposition 98 minimum guarantee. So there's been a lot of talk in Sacramento about what do you do about volatility? Some people are very, very concerned about it. Well, one, you can just live with it. But if you live with it, that is, you don't want to make changes to your revenue structure that might reduce this revenue volatility, it means your best way budgetarily of dealing with that volatility is your reserves, what we just talked about. If you have reserves, you've dampened your spending above levels that you can afford in the longer run, and you've put aside money that can address a downturn when it happens. So if you're not gonna change your, your revenue structure, you better have a lot of reserves. Now there's talk about should we change our revenue structure to make it less volatile, what would that entail? Well, you probably have to tax capital gains at a lesser rate, you'd have to change your progressive rate structure in some way. And in fact, over the past several years, we have not made our volatility, we haven't lessened it, we've actually made it worse. And you're going to be voting on a follow-up to Prop 30 that will make it slightly worse because again, we're relying more on high-income taxpayers where the volatility is concentrated. It's not a reason to vote against it, it's just you need to be aware of that. So if the direction we're moving in is we're not gonna change our revenue structure, in fact, we're making it somewhat worse, I think you can see how important then that the reserve issue is, how budgetarily you deal with the volatility. Uh, this I threw in just because property taxes are, are so important to the Proposition 98 minimum guarantee that in test two and test three years, the state loves to see great property tax growth because that reduces how much the general fund has to pay towards the guarantee. And you can see that while after we dipped during the recession, assessed value growth is now above its historical average. It's very solid. And so that is, again, good news for the general fund budget. Doesn't necessarily affect Proposition 98. It's great news for the general fund budget, as we'll show in just a minute. One of the only ways that we, can ha we have to sort of gauge how are we doing now? What, what is an indicator that uh, may suggest what's ha gonna happen in the future? And that's cash. That is, we're three months into the year. Cash comes in all the time. Payments by on withholding that all of us make. Businesses make payments, estimated payments by, by taxpayers. So how does the cash look? Well, the last two months of 15, 16 were not particularly good. They were a little bit less than what we had hoped. And that wasn't surprising given the downturn in the stock market at the start of this calendar year. But so far, 
the three, four months that we've, the three months that we've had in 16.7, cash is tracking pretty well with our estimates. So as of now, no reason to be alarmed uh, about how cash actual revenues meshes with our budget estimates. All right, let's, so let's get to the outlook. Um, as John noted, we put out every November our uh, fiscal outlook, which tries to suggest what might be coming in the future. How are expenditure trends? How do they play out? And it's obviously very difficult to forecast if the economy, the national or California economy, even 12 or 18 months in the future, let alone four or five years. And I think we've, we've now sort of talked about the outlook as possible scenarios. We're not, we're not trying to predict what's going to happen in four years out. We want to show you what could happen under different situations. And because our report is not out yet, I'll have to rely on some estimates we did in May and even that last November. But I think the story is pretty much the same. So this was uh, back in May for the budget. This was our, our estimates for the Proposition 98 minimum guarantee under a growth scenario. And what I mean by that is most national macroeconomic forecasters will simply forecast somewhat sort of steady growth out over the period. They don't really call a downturn. And you can see that the guarantee goes from about 72 billion to, to 78 billion, which is not particularly rapid growth. In fact, I think it's a lot easier if I show that same chart in percentage terms, so you get a sense for what's really happening to the guarantee. And so here you see that it grows at about 4% in 1617 in the, the next year, the upcoming budget year. Now, again, that's pretty good. Remember, statewide, slightly negative ADA. So that money doesn't have to go to pay for new students. It can go for increasing funding for existing students. The problem is, once you get to the two years, you see that the growth in the guarantee really slows. Well, why is that? Well, this assumes no Proposition 55. This assumes that the Proposition 30 higher pit rates that people approved a few years back go off. And so what you have is a ratcheting down of personal income taxes. So you have very low growth in the minimum guarantee. It's still positive. You're not going negative. And that was because of the way that Prop 30 was devised. It sort of stepped down the revenue losses so you don't have this big cliff effect all in one year. So that's one big story is that you don't get particularly big growth here, although it is still growing. But look at this. This is the general fund. What's happening to the, what the general fund has to pay towards the guarantee? And you see it's very, very low. Well, why is that? Well, it's what we talked about. We're assuming that assessed valuations of property tax revenues are continuing to grow at fairly good rates so that what the guarantee does grow, you have more of it being absorbed by property taxes and the general fund has to come in with not as much. So the mix doesn't affect the overall level of the guarantee, but it has really important implications for the state's overall budget, as we'll see in just a second. So again, just some key assumptions in our growth scenario. Again, it's just one scenario amongst many. That we're in test three all but one year. Some of you will know the test three, what that means. Uh, it, it's just that you have, instead of the, the guarantee growing with the economy, change in personal income, it's, it's growing with general fund revenues. And because of the phase out of the Prop 30 taxes on personal income taxpayers, we're in what's called a test three year. Now, when you're in a test three, you have what's called maintenance factor. Again, many of you will know that term. It just means that it's not a debt. It's not something that you have to pay back in a year, but it's what you have to build back up to over time. And the maintenance factor is really important to understand because it explains why we had those really rapid levels of growth from, from 12, 13 to now. We were paying back huge amounts of maintenance factors, shortfalls that that schools experienced in the bad years, we do get back up eventually to the levels and we almost paid back off all of our maintenance factor. Under this growth scenario, we'll get back into having some maintenance factors. As I mentioned before, slightly negative ADA enrollment growth statewide. 
over the entire period. And for some of you, really important because it helps drive spending that goes to schools, we have a cost of living adjustment uh, around 2% a year. All right, so, so what does that mean for the overall budget? Well, back in May, under the gross scenario, not necessarily the one with the highest probability of happening, but even with, the, with Proposition 30 revenues falling off, no extension of those tax increases, we showed that the state had surpluses, had operating surpluses. Now, they weren't huge, three to four billion, and those monies would go to build up the reserve or just be available for whatever the legislature wanted. Now, those numbers probably are a little bit lower because this was done before the final budget was passed. But in effect, we had that the state was in fairly good situation, assuming they didn't make any more commitments, even out over the next three or four years. Now, some factors to consider. As I said, they're probably somewhat smaller because we did do some additional spending and no additional commitments. That doesn't typically happen. So you just need to be aware when people give these forecasts of what are the underlying assumptions that are being made. Now, the important thing, again, I think when we're trying to do this a lot is that we present other scenarios. And this was a recession scenario that we did last November, and I assume we'll do again this November. And so take those surpluses that we just talked about, and if we had just a mild recession, instead of having operating surpluses, you have operating deficits. And in fact, these deficits would probably be much worse than what we showed last no November because revenues are a little bit less than what we assume. Spending is more than what we assume. So under this scenario, these, sort of, these deficits would be much worse. But again, I think this chart also helps show you why it's so important to have reserves. Of the operating deficits, the lightly shaded part of the bars below zero are deficits that could be accommodated with the existing reserves that we have. So it suggests that you wouldn't really have to deal with your problem until 1920. This dark piece that you didn't have the reserves, you had to take some actions to get your budget in line. So that's what reserves do. They buy you time. You don't have to make these huge adjustments like schools, like health and human service programs, like the universities, all had rather drastic changes that occurred in 2008, 9, 9, 10, 10, 11. If you have reserves, you can make that adjustment process much more easily. So what about Proposition 55? This is the extension of the Proposition 30. And let's first let's talk about what it is, very briefly. So it continues the higher personal income tax rates on high income taxpayers, top, roughly the top 1% of people, depending on whether you're single or married, the, Income levels vary from about 270,000 for a single person to about 550 for a, a married couple. So it adds three additional rates, and it, it would extend them from 2019 to 2030. It does not extend the quarter cent sales tax that was part of Proposition 30 that's going off at the end of this calendar year. And it has a provision regarding Medi-Cal spending don't ask me to explain why that's there, but of the new monies that would be provided, Medi-Cal could get anywhere from zero to $2 billion of it. So what's the fiscal impacts of Proposition 55? And so it's amazing, well, of course, it's going to raise a lot of money, and people want to know, this. well, give me a number. How much is it going to raise? Well, you all know now why we couldn't give you one number. We have to give you a range of numbers. And so what we said in the voter guide that I think maybe you've probably gotten in your, in your mails, uh, it said it could be anywhere from four to nine billion dollars a year. Well, four to nine, that's, that's a pretty big range. <laughs> You'd sort of like to know a little more precision. And why can't we give you more precision? Well, go back to the capital gains chart. We're looking at it starting in 1920, four years from now, three years from now, we have no way of knowing what the economy is going to be like in three years. If the, if the stock market is tanked, if the economy is in a recession, you'll get at the lower end. It's also over a 12-year period, so during that time, we could have some really good times and the stock market is booming. 
and I'm running out of time, so I will close up here. Anyway, so you have this huge range. What's the impact on 98? Well, again, it'd be like, nice to say you're going to get this much money. Uh, we had to say, where well, are you going to get roughly half of it? Some years you could get nothing. Some years you could get 100%. On average, we think you'll get in the sort of 40 to 60% range. And that's just because of how difficult Proposition 98 is in the formulas and trying to predict what's going to happen. And then finally, the impact on the budget bottom line, even though it's obviously great for schools, and there'll be more money under Proposition 2 for reserves, for debt, and maybe Medi-Cal, I'm not sure how that formula is going to work, but the rest of the budget may not see much change at all. You could have a situation where you had six, seven billion dollars in new revenue, and it all goes to schools, Medi-Cal, Prop 2, and debts. And so health and human services, universities, criminal justice, other programs that may be looking for extra money, uh, there may not be anything left over. That's our website. Lots of information if you want more on schools. We just put out our California spending plan. If you want to know about what's in the budget, please go to the site. And with that, I'll turn it back over to John for questions or comments. Thank you, Mac. And we do have about 15 minutes where we can do Q&A. And we have a microphone set up in the middle of the room. So if you'd like to ask the California legislative analyst a question, uh, just come up to the microphone and uh, you, you can ask that question. So Mac will stick around for a few questions. So um, do we have any takers? Oh, right there. And uh, please uh, ask it as a question and uh, less of a statement. Thank you. Sure. So uh, my name is Darlene Wallach. I'm from a, a Luther Burbank School District. It's a one school school district in San Jose. And uh, given that um, corporations like Hewlett Packard and, and Apple really benefit from educating our f the future workers, it would seem to me it's in their best interest to invest and, and then have pay more to invest and uh, have better education for the kids. So I would think if we can talk about it in that way, investing as opposed to paying taxes, maybe we could get changes in Prop 13 so these big corporations who own really valuable land would pay more and also just have the corporations pay their fair share in taxes to uh, promote better education. What's the possibility of framing it that way, uh, of a, you know, using investing versus paying taxes uh, to make some changes? Well, I'm not sure I'm the best person to respond to your question. It seems like it's more of a strategic question about how you go about making changes that you may want. Um, you know, it's interesting, you mentioned Proposition 13. My office just put out a report about common claims about Proposition 13 that uh, address some of the issues you raised about, you know, whether they're paying their fair share or more. And it, it has some rather interesting findings that are sort of contrary to what maybe are common understandings about who's paying that burden or not. Uh, so I, I really can't answer your question. I mean, corporations, corporations don't pay taxes, people pay taxes either investors in the company, their workers, or the people who buy their products. And I think you have economists who are really sort of question of a corporation tax, the basis for having a corporation tax, because we don't even really know who, who bears the incidence of that tax. So I think you want to be really careful about, you know, the way that you tax people, you want to make sure that you're aware of who's bearing the incidence of those taxes. We have time for a few more questions. If anyone wants to ask the legislative analyst a question, uh, you can come on up to the microphone. Hi, my name is Reed Myers. I'm a school board member in Sunnyvale. And you mentioned a lot about the importance of having reserves, and we all agree that it's really important for our school districts to have reserves. Um, what's the status of 799, and what are the odds that we won't be able to keep those reserves? Oh, you're, t you're talking about the bill, yeah. Reserve cap yeah. from Prop 2 that was approved by the voters two years ago. Yeah. Uh, well, you may know that my office actually put out a report on, on that issue. And because it was passed really at the last minute, and I, there wasn't a lot of information about, you know, what's the effect on local school districts. And a few months back, my, my office put out a report in which we actually tried to provide data about what were the level reserves, how were they being used, 
And uh, we found like there was just really no good reason in our view to, to have those sort of requirements. Uh, it's especially important for small districts, which had the highest levels of reserves, uh, who had much more, talking about volatility, they could have one workers' comp claim or, or one incident that could really hurt their budgetarily. So we, we really didn't see any reason to have those reserve requirements and recommended that the legislature repeal those. Chris Savoli with the College Board. Um, I'm wondering how important affordable college is now with the governor's budget. What you're thinking is on free community college and perhaps an increase in the Cal Grant program. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that all. Affordable college, how uh -huh. important that is in the state budget, and what you're thinking is on free community college and increasing the California Grant program. Well, I, if I heard everything right, um, I think the, the state has done an incredible job, frankly, on financial aid. Our Cal Grant program is an entitlement program. Uh, basically, low-income kids don't pay any tuition. Now, it doesn't take care of necessarily all expenses, uh, but the schools also chip in grant aid, federal aid. So I think we do a pretty good job of that. I think the question on community colleges, and I think you were asking, should it be free? Uh, you know, that's interesting. You can actually take another twist, which is something my office did, and that is, should we actually be charging more fees? California has the lowest community college fees in the country, and we don't get to take advantage of a lot of federal aid that would actually come into the state if we raised our fees slightly. And when, when you take into account the federal credits that are available for families, lower middle income families that would pay fees, uh, we put out a report several years ago that we thought it would be a net win for the state and students if we actually increased our fees such that we could take advantage of federal aid, federal tax credits. So, I mean, I think that's just a complicating factor, but it, it still is trying to get at your point of, you know, are, are we being affordable enough? And again, on community college, we have, I think it's 40, 45 percent of all credits are waived. Kids don't pay tuition. So when you take into account our Cal Grant programs, the fee waivers, we have a very, very generous financial aid, but I'm sure people can make the argument that in some cases we still have some gaps or could improve on it. Okay, we have time for one more question. I don't see anyone coming up to the mic, so thank you, Mac. Thank you very much.